So you talk a lot about malevolence and I've thought about it a lot. And I think about these loops and patterns and the way that we grew up. I'm, I wonder, and maybe the definition is important of, of malevolence and what you mean. Harm for harm's sake. So it's intentional. It's aware. It's not only intentional. The person who's doing it knows it's wrong. They do it anyway. So it's not by accident. This isn't the kind of patterning or things like that that drive someone to be reactive or combative, but they're really just protecting themselves because of something else going on in their psyche or in their experience. This is someone who is mean, mean to be mean. Yeah, they're out to hurt. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's like that some of the time. And some people are like that more often than others. I think one of the best... And we should talk a little bit about more about self-awareness too, because mm -hmm. uh, we didn't quite finish that. But um, resentment can drive that, right? Mm -hmm. You get resentful. Mm -hmm. You're not getting what you want. You won't admit what you want. You feel oppressed. You feel that things aren't going your way in an unfair way. That mm -hmm. can make you want to hurt. It's very powerful motivation. Mm. And it's very unfortunate. But There's more awareness there, but is there not some level of defense there? No, there's revenge. It's more like revenge. I mean, look, that, that defensive reaction occurs. I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. So, but I wouldn't consider that malevolence. Malevolence is, I'm going to hurt you even if I hurt myself doing it. And maybe if I hurt myself doing it, so much the better. Oh, you I've know. had that on the racetrack before. Oh, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Of course. Of course. Well, and you know, if you want to hurt your parents, that's the right way to do it. You hurt them and yourself. And if you don't think people will do that, you just don't know anything about people. I mean, yeah. pe people will do that. And there's a deep streak of that capability within us. So, so I, I, I started to understand this a little bit in many different ways. But, you know, in, in the story of, of Adam and Eve... Adam and Eve open their eyes, right? Their eyes are open when they eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, mm. well, they, their eyes are open. They notice that they're naked. And that's when they learn about good and evil. I thought, why in the world? How does that make sense? Their eyes are open. They see that they're naked. That makes sense that that's associated with vision. Why would that be associated with the knowledge of good and evil? Well, nakedness is vulnerability. You talked about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Well, Malevolence exploits vulnerability. So once I know that I'm vulnerable, I know how to hurt you. Right? I can use it. That's and I do think that's something very specific to human beings. I mean, animals hurt each other. Chimpanzees tear each other apart. But mm. human beings can be unbelievably calculated in their use of brutality. And that's because we know what hurts. We have imagination for that, and then we can use it. And it's part of being self-conscious. It's a, it's, a, it's a catastrophic consequence of being self-conscious. You can think of it that mm -hmm. way. So, because if I want to imagine how to hurt you, I just have to think, well, what would really hurt me if I was in her situation? Mm -hmm. And bang, I've got it. And I think that's, in some sense, it's defensive, you know, because people are often driven to resentment by suffering that they can't tolerate, can't attribute meaning to. But it, it passes a line, you know, when you start adding to it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's something that needs to be checked, and checked in all of us. Is there a reason or uh, any statistical research that shows what makes one more malevolent than another, which, or uses, uh, hurts other people more? Well, you said second, you said a um, hundred times more likely to be, what did Step you say? parent. That parent abused, yeah, yeah. Well, alcohol does certainly. Alcohol really being may, drunk. <laughs> oh yes, I mean alcohol. Alcohol is a very bad drug for violence. Fifty percent of people who are murdered are drunk, and fifty percent of the people who murder them are drunk. And that's true for almost every violent crime. In fact, if you eliminated alcohol, you'd eliminate most interpersonal violence. Look, I, I find that this is kind of an interesting topic because I, I think it's interesting that alcohol is legal mm -hmm. and yet, you know, you get, you, you do terrible things sometimes. You probably couldn't, um, you probably like, couldn't have made any, uh, a worse drug legal right? By, from an epidemiological perspective. On the other hand, you have 
marijuana or um, uh, psilocybin or uh, LSD even or some of these other drugs and they make you thirsty, <laughs> make you laugh, and you wake up feeling fine. I find it really fascinating that alcohol is the illegal one. How did that ever happen that that, or is the legal one? How did, why does our system I think work? it probably happened because it was so easy to make and it was just everywhere. So right, because all you really have to do is put barley in water and you get beer, right? So it was really easy to make. And at sure. least in many societies, it's been around for a very long time. And so it became legal just because, well, back in the Middle Ages, people drank alcohol, not water, because all the water was polluted. Right, right. Right, so, so that's the reason. But it certainly wasn't a consequence of evaluating the drugs by their comparative risk and rank ordering them and making, you know, the least harmful legal. It wasn't that at all. Because alcohol is unbelievably dangerous. I mean, about 10% of people become addicted to it in one way or another. Really? And far more people than that abuse it. Yes, at least once in their life, yes. Yeah. It's really bad. I studied alcohol for years. Uh, it was my th subject of my PhD. Um, oh, my goodness. So. Do you believe that, um, are you a fan of the legalizations that have happened with marijuana and the things that have I don't see that making them illegal has worked. And I don't think there's good evidence that legalizing them has had detrimental consequences. Right. I mean, we legalized marijuana in Canada just mm -hmm. before the pandemic. <laughs> so the marijuana stores were open through the whole bloody pandemic, weirdly enough. But, I mean, in, in terms of interpersonal aggression, marijuana doesn't even register compared to alcohol as, as, as a social danger. Now, I'm not saying that it's without its harm. I mean, I've, I've had friends who I think were tilted towards psychosis because of marijuana. And there's some evidence that its use, if you're predisposed to psychosis, can, can exacerbate that tendency. Now, he, he may have used it to self-medicate, so I can't say that it was necessarily the cause, but it looked to me like it wasn't good. And I saw lots of people when I was a kid for whom pot wasn't good. Mm -hmm. I saw some for whom it was good, <laughs> but many it wasn't. It, changed them a lot and not for the better as far as I was concerned. So what do you but, think uh, of the therapeutic mm -hmm. side of um, things like psilocybin and the things that MDMA psilocybin and that's its own monster. God only knows about psilocybin. Yeah, I, I just no one has any idea what that is. So I don't know what to say about LSD is the same sort of thing. It's like mm -hmm. those drugs are so far beyond our comprehension that I mean, it takes almost no LSD. It's the most powerful pharmacological stu substance ever yeah. discovered. It mm -hmm. takes a couple hundred million molecules, which is really none at all, to, to put you somewhere completely else. It's, it's, it's unbelievably powerful. Those drugs, DMT, psilocybin, LSD, they're, I think they're the biggest mystery there is, as far as I can tell right now. I don't think there's anything we understand less than those drugs. And marijuana is sort of in that category because it's a mm. quasi hallucinogen, but um, it's not the same sort of thing as DMT or psilocybin or LSD, mescaline. Hmm. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I know that DMT has been called like the spirit molecule, right? So, yeah, it, people regularly report, you know, encounters with other beings when they when they take DMT, much to the chagrin and shock of the people studying them. Right. So we, there's just no one has any idea how to account for it. So it's hard to account for whether or not there's a benefit or not to it. Well, th that's a different story to some degree. There was a large scale study done, population level study of hundreds of thousands of people who had either used psychedelics or who hadn't. Mm. And the ones who had used them at least once were healthier by almost every marker. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that you could attribute it to the psychedelics because there might have been other differences between the populations, but there certainly was no evidence that the psychedelic use had made those people worse. And then Roland Griffiths and his crew in, at Johns Hopkins, who were doing very careful studies of psilocybin, have showed that it's extraordinarily powerful uh, mechanism for helping people quit smoking and for overcoming their fear of death if they have cancer, which is no one, you know, why yeah. does it help them overcome their fear? Well, that's a deep mystery. That's a very, very deep mystery.